while you're doing so, take your Bibles and open them to Ephesians chapter 2. It was the late spring of 2012. We were in the, the height of our basketball ministry, and uh, I remember the time it was Pastor, myself, Bob Callender, and Sean Scott, and the four of us would be on rotation, but giving the word to, to, to the basketball guys. And I remember this late spring, maybe even early summer night, it was my turn. And my text for that evening was Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And I remember talking to those guys that evening, and it was a very special evening for me, because that evening and sharing the gospel, proclaiming the word of God, the truth that God has in his word, it was confirmed to me and it was confirmed to others. That night was, in a sense, where I submitted to my call to ministry. And so I will forever remember the night standing on the basketball court, I can tell you what I was wearing. I can tell you where I was standing. I can tell you the response of the people. And it was Ephesians chapter 2, and the words, and you were dead. This is a very dear text to me. It is a text that has revolutionized and changed my life in many ways. It is a theologically rich text. I mean, it is packed. And we would do injustice if we sought to get through this text even in one evening. So instead of a three-hour sermon, I figured I would give you three sermons, which is really, really just one sermon in three parts. Let me ask you, what is the greatest miracle we see God perform? Is it turning water into wine? Is it breaking the laws of physics with bread and fish? What about giving sight to the blind? We might think one of the greatest miracles we see is when Jesus calls forth Lazarus. And all of these miracles that we have seen in, in the scriptures are absolutely amazing. And I don't think it's necessarily right to create a hierarchy of miracles. But I would argue that there is a great miracle that we see in our lives. And it is the miracle of conversion. Being a Christian is not taking up religion. But in fact, it is God taking us up. It is new birth. It is to be born again, or more accurately stated, it is to be born from above. And this is nothing less than a miracle by the sovereign hand of God. The greatest miracle that we see in our world today is what God is doing before our eyes, converting sinners and turning them to Christ. God, by the Holy Spirit, through the message of the gospel, convicts men and women and children of sin, changes their hearts, and causes them to desire to follow Jesus. So one question I want us to have from the outset as we would consider this text. Has this miracle occurred in your life? Tonight's sermon is titled, When Good Things Happen to Bad People. And this, as I said, will be part one. And the main idea that I would like for us to take away from the big picture over the next few weeks from this passage is that God's power is put on full display in the salvation of sinners by raising them from the dead. So as you have turned in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, please stand for the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love for which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, bless the preaching of your word. May your people be edified this evening. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. If you are somebody that holds on to an outline or takes an outline, you will notice that there are three headings on an outline supplied. It is intentionally formatted the way it looks. There are two headings down all the way to the bottom. We will not consider those. And the one thing that I want us to get today, that this evening, is I want us to grasp the magnitude of the human condition that Paul explores here in the first three verses. And so our our main text for consideration will be verses 1 through 3 this evening. We cannot lose sight of the importance of this theologically, practically, and with application. Consider the first four words of chapter 2. And you were dead. Nowhere in Scripture is the human condition so quickly and profoundly summarized and then then in these first three verses. In a few short marks from the pen, Paul describes a most dreadful reality. There are other places in Scripture that will talk about the human condition. Genesis 6, 5, Jeremiah 17, 9 deal with the human heart. Romans chapter 1, 1 through 3, summarizes that all have sinned and are accountable to God without any excuse. But it is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that we come face to face with the weight of our condition. Or as some here in our church put it, the gravity of our depravity. We must understand rightly the biblical doctrine of the human condition. We must understand this rightly in order to understand salvation properly. Salvation is not God helping sick people. It is not a picture of you drowning in the ocean and Christ throwing you a life preserver. Salvation is not simply an offer from God that is dependent upon whether or not you accept it. No, in all of these types of views I've just mentioned, the biblical doctrine of man has the edges softened. So either that a moral dilemma might be fixed, or that this message might become more palatable for people's ears. People don't want to hear they're dead, they're depraved. So the presentation of a gospel that lowers and changes the view of the human condition goes something like this. Come to Jesus. Do you want to go to heaven or hell when you die? Spoiler alert, everybody wants to go to heaven. Jesus died for you so that you would not go to hell. You've done some bad things, but we all have, have we not? Come to Jesus and you'll be forgiven. Your life will have purpose and you will go to heaven when you die. While all those things are true, in a gospel presentation like this, there is little to no mention of sin. And the appeal to come to Christ is for the benefit of the one who will come. Ultimately, it is the person's decision. All the weight goes on that person's choice. This is the consumer gospel. 
And I will even say in my own life earlier on as a Christian, I was guilty of this form of evangelism. I had well-meant intentions, but I was ignorant. And so I want us to consider here the human condition from verses one through three and how that will shape our understanding of salvation, evangelism, and ultimately and primarily when we come to grips with the biblical definition, the biblical understanding of the human condition, it fuels us to worship. Let us consider here even these first four words. Even before them, let's consider the first word of chapter two. And. This word here joins in the thought from the previous chapter. Uh, you, you, I hope you, you, we, we do know that uh, chapter and verse divisions are helpful. They're not inspired. And so what can, what can train our minds is we would look at our Bibles and we would see the big two there and then maybe a one. And we kind of think, okay, we're on to the next thing. Paul's continuing the same flow of thought here. So what, it can kind of be tricky that you think something new is happening. It's not. Paul is picking up on the same thought that he had in the previous chapter. And how does he conclude? He's going into this great exposition and explanation of the power of God. And really the thought is picked up in verse 19 of chapter 1. Look back there. And he's talking about the immeasurable, remember this, out of this sphere greatness of the power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. And then 20, 21, and 22, 23 is his demonstration of power in Christ. And now he shifts, and he's still on the same idea of the power of God, but now it's the demonstration of the power of God towards you. And you. This word you here, he's talking about the Gentiles. He is continuing the you, we motif that he started. He did, you could see it in verse 11 of chapter 1. He would say, in him we have an obtained inheritance. And then in verse 13 of chapter 1, he would say, in him you also. And he's doing this, this we, you thing because he's building up to the point that he gets to in the second part of chapter 2. Chapter 2 can neatly be divided into two things. He's dealing first with the moral dilemma. And then in the second part of chapter 2, he's dealing with the ethnic or the legal dilemma here. So he's doing this, this we, this you and then you would see even in verse 3, and then he would, again, he would say, among whom we all, to finally build up to chapter 2, verse 14. I mean, he's getting to the point here in verse 14. He says, for he, talking of Christ, he himself is our peace who made us, no longer we, you, but he has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Right now he's saying, and you Gentiles. If you have a King James Version or a New King James Version, you will notice that the next part in your text is italicized. If you're reading from the King James, it'll say, he hath quickened. If you're reading from the New King James, it might say something that he made alive. I don't want to get lost here on this, but let me explain this to you. It's in italics because it's not there in the original translations or the original manuscripts. These statements are added. They're added to provide commentary because it was thought that it might help the text seem a little more readable. It was probably the translation of William Tyndale that then the, the translation committee of the King James took Tyndale's translation and added that back into them when they came up with their King James version. And what has really occurred here in this text is that if you would look down at verse 5, they have just taken the commentary of verse 5 and brought it back up into verse 1. It is more helpful to read in more modern translations, ESV and ASB, something like that, Simply the four words, and you were dead. Let me tell you now, the only good part of tonight's message is the word were. It's past tense. That's the good news. Now let us consider 
the weight of this word dead. What does Paul mean here as he looks to these Gentiles? I was born on March 9th, 1987. To some of you, that sounds old, and to some of you, that sounds young. Maybe a couple of you, that's right up our alley, right? 1987, I was born. I have always been alive. That doesn't sound like a very profound statement. So what is Paul talking about here when he talks about death in the past tense? When we talk about death, we always talk about it in the future, do we not? We always speak in the future tense, not the past. We are going to die, right? One day we will face death. Even in Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once to die. It is a time in the future. So we have to conclude here, Paul's not talking about a physical death. It's not that we were once dead people that God made alive physically. No, death physically is in front of us. So what is this death that he's speaking of that's behind us? If it's not physical, we must conclude that it is a spiritual death that he speaks of. And so what is this spiritual death? I think it would be healthy for us to develop and understand a theology of death. Do you understand that when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about man's condition, when we talk about all the necessary components in the explanation and the presentation and the delivery of the gospel, you can't start in Matthew chapter 1. You can't start at the beginning of the gospels. So where do you go? Where's the starting point? If you were to develop a theology of death, where would you go? You got to go back to the beginning. You got to go back to Genesis So let's do that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And I want you to see this because it is so important. It is so important for us to understand. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, God has completed all of his creation. Day 6, he's created man. And then he gives the creation mandate to Adam in chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you shall surely eat of every tree of the garden. Here is grace. I've given you all of this. It is always grace before law, no matter what. That is the way God has always worked. He says, he puts him in there and says, I've given you everything. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. There's law. For in the day you eat, you will surely die. We know the story. We know what happens. Just go over to chapter 3, verse 5. And we get the deceptive words of the serpent. Actually, verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we saw and you see that the woman sees that it's good. It's a delight to the eyes. It'll make one wise. So she eats. This is the absolute betrayal. God does not lie. They eat the fruit, but they don't, they don't just fall away and disintegrate at that time. So was God talking about a future death to Adam? No. Adam and Eve did not physically die after they ate the fruit, but they did spiritually. They did spiritually. How ridiculous, how crazy is the statement that the serpent made? He says, if you want to be like God, disobey God. You won't surely die. He's talking in the physical sense. God was speaking in the spiritual. The moment that Adam ate from the tree, he plunged headfirst into a cesspool of depravity, sin, and death. The evidence is clear. The evidence is, compl- is clear even in Genesis. Our theology of death starts in Genesis. It can be rooted in Genesis, and it'll be traced throughout 
Take, for example, the evidence we would see in Genesis about Adam's depravity, Adam's spiritual death. Three core traits of all who are in a state of sin and misery that have experienced and that are in a state of spiritual death. The first one is shame. Genesis 3, 7, then their eyes of, the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They felt shame for the first time. This is a direct effect of sin. This is a direct consequence. You know, people talk about, um, and as a parent, we, you know, we think about, you know, is there an age of accountability for children? And I don't know if you can necessarily come up with some hard and fast answer. But one thing I look for in my children, is there a shame of nakedness? Because when that happens, they are realizing something. Why do we wear clothes? It's a reminder of our sinfulness. We cover ourselves. And so the first characteristic that we would see of the state of, of someone in the state of sin and misery, depraved, dead, spiritually dead, is there is shame. Second, in Genesis 3, 8, guilt. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They felt guilt. So they hid themselves. They hear God coming, and they run from the presence of the Lord because guilt or darkness wants nothing to do with the light. They don't want to be exposed. So now they have shame, and they try to cover themselves. Oh, here, this is what happens, right? We want to try to make amends for what we've done wrong. They try to cover themselves. They run and hide from God. And finally, the third thing you would see here is fear. An unhealthy slavish fear in chapter, or in verse 10. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He was afraid of God. Shame, guilt, and fear are all a result of the fall. And these will all be present in the lives of the spiritually dead. And, and as for us who have been made alive, we will battle and struggle against these three things. You will find these traits wherever you find humans. And in reality, depending on where you are in the world, entire cultural systems are based off of these three traits. In the West, we are an innocence guilt culture. We are concerned with the legal system. We place a high value on justice. We think very black and white of matters of sin and holiness. Justification by faith is our motto. And legalism becomes our trap. Many places in Africa... They are a power or fear culture. This is why witch doctors and mysticism are so prevalent. This is why charismatic theology spreads like wildfire through parts of Africa. Faith healers and prosperity gospel. This is a consequence. Places like the Middle East and the Far East, those are honor and shame cultures. This is why Islam has such a grip on people. To convert to Christianity is to bring shame to the family. Honor is the highest value. If you have to lie to preserve the honor of the family, the lie was a good thing. Now, we would say, no, no. That's because we're marked by a, a guilt and innocence culture. And this is why almost 20 years ago, planes were hijacked and flown into the World Trade Center. Because in their view, in this radical, radical Muslim extremist view, they died in honor. So shame, guilt, and fear 
are the consequences of spiritual death. And wherever you go in the world, you will find them. And all of this is because Adam sinned and died. There's one other thing that I want you to notice here in this text of Genesis 3 before we go back to Ephesians. It's the question that God asks. Let's not lose sight of this. In verse 9, but the Lord called to the man and said, where are you? God was not asking a question he did not know the answer to. This is the pursuing love of God. The justice of God, what Adam deserved, was to die spiritually and physically and to be the first one in hell for what he had done. But God pursues him. Where are you, Adam? And as you would look down later in the chapter, he covers them. Not only that, chapter, chapter 3, verse 15, God proclaims the gospel. And it's not to Adam and Eve, actually. If you look at the context of chapter 3, verse 15, the first proclamation of the gospel was to the serpent. And it was a statement of victory, of triumph. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Though man is in a state of sin, misery, and depravity, there has never been a generation without the promise of the gospel. How are Adam and Eve saved? They believe the promise of the gospel. And so, what do we see in this theology of death? As a result of Adam's death, so all of his posterity, what I mean by that, all of his descendants have inherited his sin nature. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, there, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. It doesn't take much to see the depravity of mankind. If you have raised children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Even this morning, I heard there was an incident in the little kids' Sunday school. It was snack time. They got juice boxes, and they got um, pretzels, and um, they got like this string cheese. You want to see total depravity? Give snacks to children. And so a couple of the kids, I'm not going to mention names, but if you can figure it out, you'll figure out who they were. Yep. And so... And it was his little sister, actually. So they're sitting there, and they're having snack time. And Hazel takes a bite of the string cheese. And to her, it was nasty. She wanted nothing to do with it. So she goes, and she starts eating her pretzels. And so they ask Hazel, the teachers ask, Hazel, would you like to give Oliver your string cheese? No, no. And so... This goes on for a little bit. And so you know what she ends up doing? She takes her string cheese and she refuses to give it to him and just keeps eating it. She will not swallow it. So she's got this big old mouth full of string cheese. Because in her depraved state, it was better for her to suffer with cheese in her mouth than it was to give her brother something. And so finally, when she gives up the little bit of string cheese she has left, she runs to the toilet, or runs to the, to the trash can and spits it all out. You see, even in her heart, she did not want to share. Think about raising children or being, if you've ever served in the nursery or you've served in children's ministry, from the very outset of parenting, what do we do? We try to civilize barbarians. They are, God made them so cute because they're little monsters. It is absolutely true. I don't have to teach my children how to lie, steal, and hit. Why does it just come naturally? Because it's their nature. So from the beginning, we're gospeling. We're discipling. We're teaching them right because they're prone to wrong. Children are the greatest example for us. It's just that we've gotten a little bit older, so we know how to hide it better. 
They don't hide it. They're just true to their instincts. All of Adam's posterity, all of Adam's descendants died because of Adam's sin. And they are born in this state. Adam dies spiritually in Genesis chapter 3. You notice that it only takes two and a half chapters before the corruption of the spiritually dead causes God to rid the entire earth of, of all people but one family. And one of those, of those two and a half chapters is a genealogy. Sin spreads faster than any airborne virus, and we should be more afraid of that than anything else. So, this spiritual death, it has occurred in Adam. All of his descendants have died, are born in this state. How is spiritual death described in the Bible, though? That's what I want us to consider now. But first, let's consider the opposite. If spiritual death is what we're looking at here, what does it mean to be spiritually alive? What is spiritual life? If you're like me, your brain might go to John 17, where Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they know you in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So that spiritual life is knowing God. I know some of you have been going through Packer's book. He would have, his whole premise, knowing God. Spiritual life, it is fellowship with God. It is knowing God. It is communion with God. It is enjoyment in God. It is dependence upon God. It is hope in God. It is purpose in God. It is reconciliation in God and to God. It is fulfillment and satisfaction in God. Spiritual life is amazing. It is living for your created purpose. And what Paul says, you were dead. None of that. Absolutely none of that. Spiritual death. In Ephesians, you can go back to Ephesians chapter 2. If you would look over just even a little further in verse 12. How would Paul describe spiritual death of these Gentiles? He said, separated from Christ, alienated from God's people, no hope and without God. You were once far off. 1 Corinthians, or Corinthian, or sorry, Colossians 1, 13 would say that you were in the domain of darkness, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Romans 1, exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Romans 3, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. This is what it means to be dead. So quite simply here, what Paul is saying in these first four words, to be spiritually dead means to be cut off from God. You are an enemy of God. You would see in verse 2, you are following according to the way of this world. The philosophy of this age. You are a follower of Satan. A son or daughter of disobedience deserving the wrath of the creator God. This is what it means to be spiritually dead. I told you the only good part about tonight is that it's in the past tense. But if you are not in Christ, this is a present reality. And you were dead. Notice here, again, in ver- go back to verse 1. Consider the next part of the verse, the second part. He would say, in the trespasses and sins. The key word for us to understand what he's talking about here is the word in. Paul does not say that you were dead because of trespasses and sins. It is not because you sin that you are then dead. So right here, I want this this to destroy any notion that mankind is inherently good or even neutral. 
It is not that we are dead because we have committed sins, but rather what Paul is arguing here is that we are dead, therefore we sin. Our inherited condition leads to our natural actions. Historically and theologically, this is the doctrine that has been contested for many centuries. The condition of man. The nature or condition of man came into prominence with Pelagius in the 4th and 5th century. He was the first major theologian to advocate for free will and salvation. He denied man was corrupted by sin and he also denied original sin. That anybody inherited the sin of Adam. Pelagius was condemned as a heretic at the Council of Ephesus. Augustine of Hippo stood strongly against him in defending the biblical doctrine of man's depravity. A mediating position was then sought to between Augustine and Pelagian, and it became known as semi-Pelagianism. This view, because Pelagius really believed that man could be saved without God. He could save himself. So in this view, it was rather that man and God cooperated in salvation. God had provided the means through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But man, by his own free will, enacted the beginnings of faith. This is what became known as semi-Pelagianism. This, too, was condemned as heresy at the Council of Orange. But this would become the framework work some many centuries later by the, for, for the man named Erasmus. He was, right, he was a contemporary of Martin Luther, and he wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will. And he was advocating for man's freedom. But what you have to understand in this argument is they have to deal with the constituent nature and condition of mankind. It's not the argument of freedom to make choices. We have the freedom to make choices. That what is argued is the moral ability or the moral inability of mankind. So Erasmus, in the, in the 16th century, writes his book, The Freedom of the Will. To which the fiery Martin Luther would respond with the book, The Bondage of the Will. And a complete and absolute rebuttal of Erasmus. Then came the disciples of Calvin. More accurately, they were the disciples of Theodore Beza. Calvin's, uh, the one who replaced Calvin in Geneva. And then there were the disciples of Jacob Arminius. The Arminians would recognize that man has fallen, but they held to this view called unrestricted free will. They had to deny the absolute and total depravity of mankind, mankind's moral inability. In response to this unrestricted free will view, the doctrine of total depravity was again defended and upheld. And Arminius' free will doctrine was condemned. Those that advocated for this doctrine would later become universalists, Unitarians, apostates. And they would deny the faith and walk away. The testimony of church history points towards and confirms the doctrine of total depravity. Mankind acts according to his nature in trespasses and sins and has a complete moral inability to come to Christ. This is important. You must understand this. John 6, 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Be very, you look at that verse. Nobody can come to me, he says. Notice what he does not say. He does not say no one may come to me unless the Father who sent him draws me. The word may deals with permission. The word can deals with ability. I remember in sixth grade, I had a teacher. Her name was Miss Vickery. And, you know, we we were sitting in class, and we had to raise our hand in order to ask permission to go to the bathroom. You can't just get up and walk out to the bathroom. So I'd be sitting there. I'd raise my hand. I said, Miss Vickery, can I go to the bathroom? I'll never forget. I don't know. Can you? <sighs> of 
course you can. Oh, yeah, may I? Yes, you may. Of course I can. That's why Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3, you cannot see the kingdom. Unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. He doesn't say you may not. You see, new birth precedes seeing the kingdom of God. You cannot, you don't have the ability to see the kingdom of God. You don't have the ability to enter the kingdom of God unless you have been born from above. Unless you who are once dead have been made alive. We must understand the doctrine of total depravity leaves us totally dependent upon the sovereignty of God. They cannot because they are dead in trespasses and sins. So, as I said, this key word is in. This word in that he says here at the beginning of verse 2, it signifies, this preposition signifies or speaks of a sphere or a realm in which they are in something. These two words, trespasses, paratoma, it means moral failure. It means a violation. Sins, harmatia, from which we get the, the word harmatology, which is the, the doctrine or the study of sin. This refers to the acts of wrongdoing, the breaking of divine commands by either action or neglect. We sin by what we do, and we sin by what we don't do. And so what Paul is saying here is that we were dead in this sphere of moral failure and acts of wrongdoing, paying no regard for God, his laws and his ways. We were swimming in this cesspool of immorality and love for anything but God. As a child growing up in, in Middletown, um, this was our home church while my dad was in the Navy. And we would drive uh, from Middletown, Green Lane, down. And I forget the name of the road, but uh, where, the, where the Walmart is um, near the base as you're coming down that way. Um, there was this sewage plant that we would drive by. You remember that? And as a dad would do this, this it was like, it was nasty. It was a really disgusting place. And as you would drive by, uh, my dad being true to his nature, would roll the windows down and go, <sighs> it was nasty. You would smell this, and it was just, it was so gross. And I thought he was so gross for doing all that. Now as a dad, I can see why, and I would probably do that too. <laughs> but we would drive by this nasty, nasty sewage plant. And I think... This cesspool, this sphere of transgressions and sins is so much like that, that sewage plant. About 18 months ago, we had an incident where little Hazel fell into the cesspool over at the parsonage. My mind is forever burned with the imagery that was described to me that afternoon. I wasn't there when it happened. I had come home maybe just a few minutes after. And um, the cover had been broken. We were getting ready to have it fixed. And Hazel was walking. And um, she just disappeared into the ground. Caitlin, knowing what had happened, made a mad dash over to her. And all that could be seen was this little hand sticking up in the cesspool. She was immersed in the filth. of human waste submerged in this sphere of bodily waste and human excrement. It was absolutely disgusting. When we talk about in the trespasses and sins, we must understand that we were completely immersed in our own filth, rottenness, consumed by it, and we even enjoyed it for a time. The thing is, brothers and sisters, before God came to us, we didn't even want out of it. Titus 3.3, 3, for we ourselves are once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others 
and hating one another. This is life before Christ. But there is another image that is forever burned into my mind. And that is the arm of Caitlin plunging down into that cesspool without hesitation. For a child in which she loved, it needed rescue. And plunging into that cesspool and grabbing the one little arm that she saw, pulling Hazel out of that state of misery and certain death. That's a picture of the gospel. That is what Christ has done for us who believe. He came to where we are because we could not go to where he is. We are in a state dead in our trespasses and sins. In this sphere, we can't get out of there. So what happens? Christ descends and is incarnate and comes and lives among us in our state of sin and trespasses. Though without sin, he dives headfirst into the cesspool to rescue sinners. Because they can't get out, he goes in and raises them up. This is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why we sing, my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. This is our condition We were dead in the sphere of our own cesspool, moral failure, and outright disobedience. Consider what he says in verse 2. In which you once walked. Now he's talking about dead people walking. We are truly, before Christ, the walking dead. And any outside of Christ in this room or outside these walls are right now the walking dead. So when they act a certain way, when people are, when we see all the filth in our world today and everything and we get, we get outraged by it, understand this, they're the walking dead living true to their nature. Instead of getting angry with them, what about compassion? How about we bring them the gospel instead of condemnation? Verse 2, in which you once walk as the walking dead. Doing what? He would say here, following the course of this world. What does that mean? Following the course, the path, the trajectory of this world. Which way is this world leading? What are the prevailing thoughts of our day? I'll give you three. And it's not today, they're timeless. Autonomy. This anti-authority, I'm my own boss. What did Adam want? Independence, but created to be dependent. It's the independent man, it's Burger King. You can have it your way. Or the thought you can have it all. Hope you know you can't. I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. This is the course of the world. I'm my own boss. How did Adam's quest for autonomy work out? Dead. Here's a second course of this world, materialism. Again, this is you can have it all. If you can't have it all, you should have it all. You deserve this. You see the commercials around Christmas time. They're always the GMC commercials. They got this big old bow on a car. And I think, who in their right mind surprises their spouse with a car for Christmas? Isn't that a decision that you should probably talk about? But materialism says, no, just rack it up. Swipe the credit card. Rack up all the debt you can because you want, if you can't have it all, at least look like you can have it all. If that person has it, you deserve it. This is the course of the world. And the third one, sensuality. 
do what makes you feel good. Pursue physical pleasure as if that's the chief end of man. God is not love, the world says. Love is God. Sex sells and you deserve it. This is the course of our world today. And this is what mankind in their natural state is after. Naturally, we do not desire Jesus, nor do we want Christ. Uh, Here's a test. Go offer somebody a million dollars or Jesus, a random person on the street. What are they going to take? I want a million dollars. Why? Because materialism. I want it now. Sex or Jesus? A shopping spree? A new car or Jesus? People are taking the course of this world. People don't come to Christ because they don't want him. And it doesn't matter how clear you explain the gospel. All you can do is be a mouthpiece. You cannot change the hearts. God has not given you or me the power to raise the dead. He has given us the mandate to be faithful to proclaim. And through that, he raises the dead. If it doesn't get any worse, well, let's, let's just, have, Paul, it gets worse for us, let's go. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, the walking dead follow their leader. We're all followers. And who are they following? The prince of the power of the air, they are following their leader, Satan. Satan. Listen, Satan's not the guy with the pitchfork and, you know, you got to paint your fingernails black and wear all this crazy stuff. Satan says, go to church. You're a good person. Tithe. Do it all. Because the the best place for Satan to have somebody is in the church but not converted. Because they think they're good enough. It's not just there. It's all over the place. The prince of the power of the air, as he speaks of Satan in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul would have referred to him as the God of this world. Brothers and sisters, at this moment, the picture looks pretty bleak, does it not? This is the human condition. And these aren't my words. And I'm not just telling you what the Bible says. I'm showing you what Paul, what God has to say following the way of the world, following the prince of this world, the spirit of Satan that is at work. In who? The sons of disobedience. Brothers and sisters, understand the evil one is at work in this world. And according to Hendrickson, he is energetically at work to make what is bad even worse. Think about the landscape today. There are things that my grandparents, your parents, your grandparents, unsaved, would look at and say, this is an absolute abomination. They would never have imagined the things that are going on in our world today. Look at the prevailing philosophy of the day. There's so many of them. Let's just take one. Let's look at the sexual revolution that we are going through right now. This course of this world. The power of the work of the air. Children are being told that they are allowed to decide their gender. God has determined that. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You formed me in my inward parts. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalmist would say. We don't have a right to make that choice because it is not ours to make. And it is the absolute offense against the creator. It is the truly shaking your fist. I don't like what you've done. So children are being told that they are allowed to decide their gender. If they're not in tune with their biological makeup, they're allowed to change it. And parents can get in trouble if they try to get in the way of that. And people are jumping all over this. LGBTQ+ is the holy acronym of the 21st century. 
This is the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived. Before we point the finger, it's something I was always told growing up, when you point the finger, remember you have three more coming back at you. Yes, this world is bad, but before Christ, I was a contributor to it. And so are you. By grace, you have been saved. Among whom we all once lived. So now Paul gets to the you and the we, and he says it's, it's all of us. We're all guilty. We all were once dead. We were all the walking dead, chasing the pleasures of this world, following the leader, Satan. This describes us all. At one point, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So without hesitation, unbridled iniquity, unrestrained sin, this was our lives. I don't care whether you know you were saved at six or 66. We lived for ourselves until we did not. When Christ came to us, in drunkenness, sexual immorality, we were worshipers of false religion. For some others, it was self-righteousness, pride, judgmental of those who sinned differently. We were arrogant. We were thinking because we were raised in the church, we were better off than others. One of the dangers, as I said even earlier, about being raised in the church is that you can become comfortable with being almost Christian. You got the lingo, you talk spiritual, but your heart is cold and you are dead. There's another descriptive term here at the end of verse three. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What Paul is describing here, that in our natural condition, we are left to suffer under the wrath of God. This is because of our willful disobedience. Our willful rejection of the gospel and refusing Christ. I don't know what your life was like coming to Christ, but I heard the gospel so many times before it became a reality in my life. And every time I heard it, I rejected it. What does God say? What does Christ say? The Holy Spirit will come and he will convict the world of what? Sin. And and, and he will come and convict of unbelief. To not believe the gospel is sin. John chapter 3 verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in Christ is. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Later on, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. So what Paul says here at the end of verse 3 We were children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Brothers and sisters, this is the human condition. Never let this world tell you about human nature. We must be informed by the word of God. As Paris Reed had said, it is the issue that we face is not trying to convince good men that they are in trouble with an angry God, but rather it is to convince bad men that they deserve the wrath and justice of a good God. And so what we have described and what we have considered here in these first three verses is the total and utter depravity of mankind. Humanity is not neutral, humanity is dead the walking dead, the sons and daughters of disobedience, children of wrath, without distinction. And so where does this leave us? We cannot save ourselves. We cannot do anything. I can go across the way over there and preach 
till I'm blue in the face and there's not a single soul in that cemetery that's going to respond. I can't make them. Dead people can't do anything. So dead people are totally dependent upon the work of God. We are in need of a supernatural work completely outside of ourselves, completely independent from us. So let's quickly just make this application. Any theological system that does not uphold the complete and total depravity of man, completely dead, lacking any moral ability to initiate salvation, needs to be rejected. That is little God theology. And time will not permit us now, but the two greatest words in the Bible follow this. Then in verse four, but God. That will be part two when we, know, when we consider when good things happen to bad people. But understand, you were dead, not anymore, in the past tense. So you can rejoice in the power of God that raised you to life. And think about this. You have loved ones. You have brothers, sisters, family members, friends who are dead in their trespasses and sins. We're, that's, that is to bother us. We are to pray intercessively for them. We are to lift those people up before the throne of grace, pleading that God would save their souls, that the gospel would come to them in power. We would be the means to the answer to our prayers and we would bring the gospel. We would tell them that yes, you are dead, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. We would pray that they would be made willing, that they would come. We would urge people to come, that they would be made willing to believe and respond to the gospel. The most comforting words, but God. In our depravity, we are lost, we are dead, we are undone. But God comes to enemies, plunges into our disgrace, and raises us up. Christ died that we would live. So that at the end of our days, the only truthful statement that we can make is that all we have is Christ. Me and myself, there is no good thing but I claim the righteousness of Christ. I am trusting in his finished work. I am trusting in the miracle that God raises the dead, causes them to walk in newness of life, and puts them on the path of righteousness and holiness. And brothers and sisters, if you are a Christian here, you are a testimony of the miracle of God at work in our world right now. I once was dead, but now I am alive. Let us pray.